There's something to be said for going against the trend and doing something different, and I'm really excited to finally be able to talk about today's product. Not because it reminds me of my first Acer netbook, or because it comes with an array of fancy gaming-inspired RGB lights. I'm excited to talk about the One GX1 because it's the first Windows gaming handheld that can be a gaming handheld for the times when you want it to be, and a regular UMPC for the times that you don't. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and this is another episode of the Should You Buy It series, and today we are going to take a look at the One GX1 from One Netbook. The One GX1 comes in a bunch of different configurations, but the one that I'm reviewing here has an Intel i5 CPU, a UHD 617 GPU, 16 gigabytes of LP DDR3 RAM, 512GB of SSD storage, a 12,000 mAh battery, a 7-inch IPS display with a resolution of 1920 by 1200 and Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 4.2, and either 5G or 4G data. You can get a feel for how small the GX is by comparing it to my hand. The design is slightly different from what you've seen in this market before because the hinge doesn't extend all the way to the back of the device. A good portion of the back space is dedicated to this Alienware exhaust. On the front, you can see that we have a simple pattern to fill out some of the thickness below the screen lid. Over to the right, you can see a major highlight of this device when compared to other devices on the market, and that is a SIM and SD card combo slot with support for 4 to 5G, depending on your configuration and market. You have two options for video out on this device, with one of them located on the right side with a mini HDMI port. For I.O., we have a USB Type-C port, USB 3.0 port, another USB Type-C port, and a headphone jack. These ports are surrounded by dual exhaust vents. Now let's take a look at the keyboard. A key highlight of this model is obviously that it comes with proper spacing for the WASD keys, which makes it surprisingly decent for PC gaming. I'll get into the typing experience in a moment, but I first want to talk about some of the compromises that you have with this layout. The biggest one for me is that there are some awkward key placements here that are going to take some serious relearning to get used to, most notably the backslash key and the strange arrangement of the apostrophe and colon key that doesn't seem to follow a traditional keyboard layout at all. Beyond those, the typing experience is actually fairly decent. My favorite keyboard in any device is without a doubt the older ThinkPad keyboards, even though I do use a mechanical gaming keyboard for my main PC. I did a few typing tests with this little guy, and anytime there wasn't a need to use an awkward key, my typing speed was actually really good. The video on screen now is showing what 94 words per minute looks like on the One GX1. If I were back in school, I could probably get much faster typing times using this for written work. I also like the tactile sound the keys make when you press them. Here's a sound clip of how they sound. Outside of this, there are some LED indicator lights on the top for charging, caps, and power on. In the center of the device, you'll find the One Netbook logo as your power button. Pressing this one time will put the device to sleep almost immediately, and another press will wake it up. You can also interact with this LED through fan control with function plus insert to enable quiet mode, or function plus the fan key to turn the fans on to turbo mode. In either normal or turbo mode, the device does a really good job of moving heat off the CPU, as you'll see from the gaming test later in this review. A huge highlight of this device that I haven't really talked about yet is one that's really hard to film in my studio, and that's the RGB backlit keys of the One GX1. You can see that the light is there, and this is how it looks to me in person right now. It's very faint, especially compared to my RGB keyboard that I can see in pretty much direct sunlight. If I had to pick the one thing that I don't really like about the One GX1, it's that this light is only visible after dark. I love all of the different color options that you can pick, from strobe to breathing, but I really wish that I could see it whenever I want to. Just for reference, this is what the keyboard looks like under optimal lighting conditions in the dark. Speaking of lights, you can also enable the backlight exhaust, which is visible in direct sunlight, but it's unfortunately only one color. To be completely honest, I almost never use this light because I never see it when I'm using the device, so I tend to turn it off, but it does look cool. And finally, the trackpad. This thing took a lot of time to get used to, and there are times that I still feel like I'm not quite used to it yet. My gripe with this optical sensor is that it can occasionally continue registering input even after you take your finger off, and that can cause minor changes to your cursor position when you remove your finger from the sensor. I find that this doesn't happen at all if I only use the lower two-thirds of the sensor with my finger instead of trying to use the entire thing like I would if it was a track point. I actually do use this device a lot in handheld mode without controllers due to how light it is, and this mouse design is rather unfortunate because it's almost completely unusable when you're holding this device in two hands. 
I frequently have to stop myself from reaching above the number 8 key to reach for a mouse sensor that isn't there, and I really think that they could have designed some form of mouse input in this top space that would allow you to use the device as easily as you can use the WinMax. Let's move over to the screen by talking first about the hinge. This is the first one netbook product that I've owned, so I don't really know if this is common for their products, but this hinge is really good. The hinge can hold any angle that you put it in, and while it doesn't fully articulate to 180 degrees like I wish it would, I don't feel like I have to baby it or that it will eventually snap on me. It feels like a proper laptop hinge. That leaves us with the actual screen, which is the best part of this device in my opinion. The resolution of this device is much higher than other devices on the market, and I don't tend to use the highest resolution at 100% scale unless I really need all of the screen real estate because it can get really tiny. I have a lot of custom resolution set inside the graphics control panel to increase performance in native PC games, and I tend to use 700 or 750p because it suits my eyes really well. The first thing that struck me when I used this device was the overall quality of the IPS panel. It's like they took a flagship cell phone screen and just expanded it. For those of you that don't know, manufacturers in this market do not get custom screens made like larger OEMs do when they have a product to be made. Companies in this niche get a design and then they go on the market and see what screens they can buy to fit that size. I couldn't get a definitive answer from one netbook, but I'm sure the screen used in this device must be the same one used in a high-end Android tablet. It's just laughably better than anything else on the market, and there are no situations where I would pick another product screen over this one. Now that we've covered the laptop side of this device, let's delve into the gaming aspects. As you've already seen in other parts of this video, the One GX1 comes with Nintendo Switch style controllers. I do just want to say that the ones that I have here are prototypes, so just keep that in mind. I specifically requested to borrow these from the One Netbook engineers so I could put them through their paces. Let's get one big thing out of the way right now. The D-pad is obviously not ideal for retro gaming, but it does suit their design of functioning as an independent player one controller in two player games. On both the left and right controllers, you also have the same three arrow keys that function as a variety of PC and gaming controller buttons. The analog stick is a new design that I haven't seen in a handheld yet, and I think they originally came from a Bluetooth controller of some kind. Unlike Joy-Cons that are really popular right now, this analog has an indent in the center with a textured surface that feels really comfortable on your thumbs with L3 and R3 functionality. Above this are the dual digital shoulder buttons. Based on my test, it doesn't really matter where you press on these, they seem to register input no matter what you do, except the L2 and R2 triggers that operate on a hinge. Outside of this, you obviously have the large mounting bracket that slides onto the One GX1. There's nothing really special to mention here about the right controller, except for the fact that it's probably more of a prototype than the left one since the ABXY buttons aren't finished. At the time of filming this video, I didn't have the middle component that these two controllers slide into to make a proper gaming controller, so I primarily just used them in each hand when I wasn't going to use the device handheld. In this manner, you really get a feel for just how light these controllers are, to the point where I didn't even believe that they had an internal battery at all when I first held them. Here's a quick demonstration of what it looks like from the bottom of the One GX1 when you slide on the controller. All you do is push up and slide into place. I was actually surprised to see that there wasn't a great deal of flex on the bracket when you purposely try to bend the controller in your hand. The last thing that I want to mention about this design is the fact that you never really come into contact with the heat from the CPU when you hold this device in your hands. Even though the device does do a good job of moving heat off the CPU, it's nice to not even be aware of how warm the device is under load when you're gaming because none of that heat transfers over to the controllers. I don't know if I was supposed to, but I decided to film a teardown of the controllers to see what they looked like inside. Here's a view of the internal PCB and the 380 milliamp hour battery that powers the controller along with the shoulder button mechanism. I also filmed an entire teardown of the GX1, but I lost footage for the first half of the teardown. You can see the dual fans above the huge battery in my device. This battery is rated for 46 watt hours, but mine actually seems to be a 60 watt hour battery and I don't know why. If you have any idea why, please let me know below. You can't see from this view, but I already removed the LTE card in the lower left. This is your only real path for upgrading this device, as the RAM and ROM are soldered directly to the board. Very quickly, I want to address the elephant in the room, that is the WinMax. If you are only concerned with pure gaming performance, the WinMax is much better than the GX1. To put it simply, the GX1 is essentially what it would be like to have a better version of the Win2 with better build quality and materials than the WinMax. 
Now let's jump into my favorite portion of the review, which is the gaming performance. Even though we are using an older generation of Intel GPU, the performance is actually very good for traditional PC gaming. You can obviously use this device without controllers just fine if you really just want a mini PC. I did a lot of tests of Overwatch and I found that this device is very capable, especially in team fights with a lot of effects going out. I also tried CSGO with similar performance. LOL can essentially run on a potato, so it's not really special, but the experience is really smooth. I used to be a very big competitive WoW player, and I've used all kinds of computers to play WoW, most notably the Acer netbook that I mentioned in the beginning of this video. While I probably would never do progression rating on the GX1 since the screen makes UI elements fairly small, you could easily do some casual dungeons or raids without any issues if you wanted to pack extremely light and still be able to game. If you do happen to get the controllers in whatever bundle they're available in, I found them to be more usable than just a novelty. There are obviously better controller manufacturers here in China that I wish One Netbook would partner with, but these aren't bad for a version 1 product. The good thing about this design is that the controls can be modified without having to retool the mold used in the overall product. This means that you may be able to pick up improved controllers down the line if they end up changing the style to suit your needs. Before we jump into some PC tests, I do want to mention streaming since I see this device particularly suited to be a streaming device. The screen is excellent and the battery life even at the rated watt hour is more than capable of streaming for 5 plus hours. This is not even taking into account that this device supports 4 or 5G depending on where you live. Data is super cheap here in China at around 15 cents per gigabyte and those prices are only getting better over time. Because of this, I find myself streaming more than trying to run PC games that I could run on more powerful handhelds. That's not to say that you can't game on the device without streaming. You'll just have to use a completely different set of games or use the aforementioned custom resolutions. The important thing is, I finally have a video that answers the age-old question of can it run Crisis. There's no audio in the background, but I've gone through a few hours of the game with and without GX1 controllers with no major issues on the lowest graphical settings. As a small disclaimer, before I continue, my device has an unlocked BIOS that lets me customize TDP and a bunch of other settings that can give 20-30% to 30 improvements to gaming performance. But I did not enable any of those settings since I don't believe this device will ship with an unlocked BIOS. I also got very sidetracked with this review by delving into the Minecraft Java edition for countless hours. This can obviously also run on low-end devices, so it's not really a surprise, but it's nice to see. I'll let the rest of the PC games play out uninterrupted. Just be ready for evac. I don't want to stick around any longer than I have to. From where do you hail? I've already covered a lot of PS2 and GameCube emulation performance, so I won't be covering them anymore in this video. You can find links to those videos in the 1GX1 playlist on screen now, or you can find them linked in the description box below if you're interested in seeing more. 
We're going to start off this emulation section with Wii U and Breath of the Wild. This is actually one of those games that runs at full speed if you enable higher TDP, but I am using the stock settings for this recording. The game resolution is set to 540p. Even with this stock TDP, the game is entirely playable after you build up a cache and the CPU temps are held pretty steady around 69 Celsius. The CPU in the GX1 is very capable of running 3DS, even though there are cheaper ways to do so. That leaves us with the Switch, which is another system where you can see 20 to 30% improvements in FPS by using a higher TDP, but I'm not using one in this footage. I've already featured this game running on the Win 2, but the most significant difference that I noticed is the fact that the emulation runs at a much lower temperature than it does on the Win 2 with the added benefit of having higher frame rates. Let's move over to PSP with God of War at 3x resolution. You can actually go higher than 3x if you wanted, but there's almost no difference in appearance with a screen size this small. My PS3 tests were rather strange due to some GPU driver issues. I couldn't get Vulkan to work for the games that I tried that should have run at full speed, so I was stuck with OpenGL, and that had a host of problems that you can see in the footage on screen now. So that leaves us with the question of should you buy the GX1, and that's hopefully something that you'll know one way or the other based on this coverage. In my opinion, the GX1 is for a very specific type of person in this niche. If you're interested in the GX1, it's probably because you want a gaming device that has the ability to hide the fact that it's a gaming device if you work in an office or go to university. That, or you want a device that's perfectly positioned to take advantage of next-gen cloud gaming. I use the GX1 as a mini PC with 4G data about 60% of the time that I use it, and I always have it with me because of how light it is. One Netbook has plans to use a better Intel chip in a future version of this device, and much of what I've said here will hold true for that product, but it will most surely be more expensive than this current model. Anyway, that's it for this review of the One GX1. You can find product links to a few online retailers that are selling this device in the description box below. Let me know what you think about this little guy in the comments below, and while you're there, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel to help support my work. If there's something else that you want to see on this device, feel free to leave a suggestion and I'll do my best to try and make it happen. I have the final versions of the controllers coming soon, and I plan on filming more of them when they arrive for another video to see what they've changed. I want to give special thanks to my channel members that help support these videos financially, and all of you that watch my videos. I'll catch you here next time with another review. Happy gaming, everyone. Takiyao.